Welcome to the Beverage Click Podcast, discussions revolving around drinks with an Asian perspective. I'm your resident host, Sean Oh, certified beverage specialist and co-founder of the Beverage Click Academy in Singapore. And here is this month's episode. What's up, my dream comrade, and welcome back to a, uh, another episode of the Beverage Click Podcast. Now, for this episode, we have the privilege of uh, inviting Mr. Leopoldo Puzieni. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank wow. God, because I have not been <laughs> pronouncing the names of uh, most of my guests, especially if they're foreigners, uh, properly. So, you know, thank you very much for, for asserting that I did the right thing. Very good job. <laughs> and you are the uh, International Brand Advocacy Manager uh, of, for Asahi Shuzo. Correct. Yes. And that is none other than Dasai. Dasai. Yes. They make Asahi Shuzo in Japan, mm-hmm. but we are the one producing Dasai. Excellent. Okay. You no, know, it's really great to have you on there. Uh, how's your trip to Singapore so far? Well, it was very good. It's my first time in Singapore. I came uh, three, days, three days ago, I believe. And uh, it's an amazing city. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I have um, actually a new, lot of new friends. So, uh, happy to, to be here at the Burger Street on my mm-hmm. third and final day. Oh, third and final day. Well, too bad you could have more days. No, you know, we can take you out and have a, have a bit of fun. I had a huge hangover last night from oh, drinking. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's all sake, so, you know. <laughs> Understandable. Uh, yeah, and then today there's that sign. So, <laughs> thank God I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still okay to function. Um, right, so, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit more about your, your background. Um, currently, where are you based? Well, I'm based in Tokyo. Oh, okay. since uh, December of last year. Nice, nice. And uh, so previously you were, you, you were in Europe? Uh, yes, I was in Europe uh, for seven years. Mm. I started in 2014 after living in Dubai. Um, I moved to Cannes at the Grand Hyatt Martinez mm. uh, in Cannes. Then after three years there, I moved to Versailles, uh, very close to Paris, minutes from Paris. And then I moved there one year to Waldorf of Astoria, and then I moved uh, to Paris, where I was like a marriage. Uh, in two different hotels. Oh, oh okay. Well, so you've been moving around? Moving around, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like all those other people, they come yes, and change from time to time. Yeah. So, so your, your background is really a hospital? Hospitality, yes, oh, yes, yes. Since, uh, I think, um, since a very young age, an uh, 18 year old that was a uh, certified son in Italy, mm-hmm. he became a grandfather, he was a producer of wine. My father really wants me to know more about that, so it was my gift for my 18 year old relative. Yeah. And then I, I started and moved to Switzerland and learned about um, hospitality and I worked in different countries like Belgium, Chicago, and so forth. And then joined the Hyatt and ha, here we are. Okay, well, but you, and, uh, you know what I mean? I, was, I didn't mean to stop you, obviously, I had to find a little bit more about you. So your, your LinkedIn profile is really quite highly decorated. You've been, that's right, you've been, you know, you've been uh, put in beverage director for, for a couple of uh, so yes, years. Yes, uh, since, since 2017. Oh, very nice, very nice. So how different is this journey, you know, with, with, uh, with representing a sake brand? Is it, is it any different? Or? It's actually very similar to my previous job. Okay. Uh, why? Because I always uh, walk around the test, okay? Uh, if not physically, like I'm doing now, at least by remote from my fourth appointment, mm-hmm. um, then I exchange a lot of ideas with the team members. And that's, I think, uh, the best part of my previous uh, job was this, to interact with the team and create the synergies between kitchen service and, uh, and the guest mm-hmm. um, and then of course is that I help whatever possible to come up with certain ideas, certain solutions to in this case elevate the sake service, sake experience for the guest and uh, of course we, we look at the competition a little bit, we see how to improve the menus and uh, how to develop certain projects and again also some uh, relations with the media so whenever I, I go out of Japan I organize some events I do my one week tour uh, between Dubai and uh, Singapore now every night I have an event. Oh wow. So yeah, you know, operations are still linked and uh, there's some strategy going on and a lot of talk and a lot of love after. So uh, it's pretty much like before. <laughs> okay. Um, and you, you have taken quite a bit of uh, sake certifications yourself. Well, I try to educate myself, but uh, you know, I still um, need to learn more and every day I study. Mm-hmm. I teach master by not only drinking, but you even visiting some Kuda in uh, Japan. We mm-hmm. were exchanging with uh, Japanese somebody about how sake is perceived and served in Japan, which is very different from uh, the way it's uh, gone so long outside uh, in Japan. I see. So, well, wine has always been your, your first. Yeah, the main my painting is, is wine. Yeah. And that's why when I started to learn about sake in a, in a very small uh, Japanese restaurant in Dubai, you know, in the oldest part of Dubai area. I was working at the, I was swimming at the high latency 
and uh, as an employee, you have special uh, rates, um, either for rooms, but for restaurants, particularly. So one night at the beginning, they invited me to this Japanese restaurant, Miyako, which is the smallest and the most ordered uh, uh, Japanese outlet in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And I tried it with my, my first sake. Uh, I felt almost, I fell almost from the chair. And uh, I said, okay, I need to learn more about that because it's so different from wine. But then the more I continued uh, to learn about sake, I was back in Japan first time, 2011, mm -hmm. uh, in February. And I was so lucky to, to um, visit Tokyo in Kyoto during the Blue Night Festival yeah. they, they, they used to have. So uh, after this exposure, then I really started to understand that to make uh, sake is in the end not all that different from making certain other drinks, for example. If, and there's a lot of uh, similarities for me with some houses in uh, Cognac or Champagne. Oh, okay. So there's similarities and differences okay. at the same time. Of course, the procedure is different, but in terms of philosophy and uh, classical excellence, I see uh, great connections. Okay. These different worlds. Okay. Um, what about, I mean, because you've been traveling a lot, mm -hmm. and previously you were know, also in Dubai, mm -hmm. do you think, you know, in your course of work with Vitasai, for example, do you think? There are lots of other countries that require more work in terms of trying to promote sake in general. Or oh, definitely, you know, um, I think that um, unfortunately COVID um, sparked a little bit the rise of uh, sake in Europe. We were at a good point, um, 2017, 2018. Uh, personally, I wrote uh, for two years for Kado magazine mm. in Osaka as a correspondent for the sake market in Europe. Um, and you know, I could see there was you know, a rising wave. Driven a little bit by this biodynamic and craft beer market. Okay. It was interesting because the guests uh, opened up the palette uh, to different um, different approach, uh, different tastes, different styles. Uh, but I think nowadays we don't agree to start from zero, but there's still a lot to do. And I think that uh, um, around the Gulf, uh, there will be more and more interest in, uh, in sake. Uh, and I think maybe the southern part of Europe. Uh, should uh, rise equally, like the northern parts of the moment. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I can see that Europe is, is starting to, to take all this of sake you know, with many uh, competitions, right? Yes. Like many yeah. advocates that I, I'm quite surprised that you mentioned about uh, the Gulf region there, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting market because, of course, there are some um, cultural traditions which would prevent uh, this kind of products to gain popularity. But because they are being so up, so much uh, to the growing up, so much uh, to the world, um, you have a lot of international travelers. Mm. And um, half of the guests that I had at uh, the mass class in Mandarin and in Dubai, actually they were uh, frequent visitors to Singapore as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that uh, Dubai, of course, is very much established. Then in November, you have the mission guide, uh, yes. enough for Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. Um, and therefore, you know, uh, the level of um, interest for this kind of products from Japan is on the rise. And somebody asked me, uh, why do you think there are so many, um, so much interest in sake in Dubai, you know, during your master class? Then I said, I think because you have no, you have a, um, a higher level of interest on gastronomy than ever before. You know, I was there between 2009 and 2014, and the level of restaurants that I saw at the time, I see now, but it's very different. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think that, um, you know, Japanese gastronomy become more and more popular because people were, you know, hungry for it during the COVID time. Yeah. Um, it helps. Uh, but I think then, well, once you move up in the uh, fine dining, then it's very difficult to go back. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, you, you did mention that um, Japanese food or gastronomy is, is, you know, it's, it's good for some it's right? Mm -hmm. but, do you think that, that there are other cuisines that might work well with the sake? A lot of different cuisines. Of course, um, we know already by the French and, uh, and the Italian one. Mm -hmm. uh, but during um, a trip that I had before COVID uh, from Paris to Tokyo, I actually took uh, out of the group Finn Airlines. Finnish Airlines. Okay, Finnish Airlines. <laughs> I said, why not? Once in my life. And I stopped by the LCP that I didn't know at all. You know? okay. And I was a little bit intrigued, but it's not crazy. And uh, I spent two nights in Helsinki, and uh, I, I really dreamt of having these different types of sake with their food, local food. It actually took me 
not potentially really interesting. Okay, yeah, that's why I think that uh, there are a couple of options yeah. that we have. And in Japan, I also had a master class with a very, very good uh, vegetarian Indian restaurant. Okay. Um, and I think that there as well, we all agree that there is a potential uh, to use uh, sake more than wine because the problem with the style of cuisine and all the vegetarian options they have, uh, wine is a bit complicated to put on the menu uh, because of, you know, you need different type of wines and the specific wine that you need has very different price points. Yeah. Yeah. But we can be really happy with like, sake. Okay. And uh, well, sake is very versatile. Extremely, extremely. And you know, all the breweries, they have um, the enormous advantage that they can innovate by using the same ingredients. Whereas the wine world hardly can, you know, mm -hmm. because they are bound by tradition, yeah. um, the name, the market, and some legal requirements that, you know, um, does not allow them to be as creative as some uh, second brewers are. Yeah, I agree. Well, some brewers are still bound by tradition, but I think you, you're right about the whole innovation part. Because they, uh, they have been focused a lot on trying to, to, to break that, that mold and, you know, just be different. You know, right. yeah. Explore new horizons. Yeah, you know, exactly, exactly. Okay, well, it's good to know about your, your perspective about sake and you know, what can work. Now I'm going to put like Nordic food and Indian food on my list. Please. So now I know <laughs> if that will be good for pairing. Um, so let's talk more about um, Dasai events mm -hmm. since you, know, you, you do represent Dasai. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, information is, is, is available, but you know, there are some things that clearly might not be sure. known by. The wider audience. Um, so, in terms of Dasa as a brand, because it's, it's, quite, it's quite popular, um, would you still consider uh, Dasa a craft? I would say so, mm -hmm. um, for the main reason that all our sake, despite what most of people might think, is all done by hand, it's all made by hand. Now, it's true that we do not have Toji no? since the uh, early 90s. Yeah. Um, Therefore, we replace the knowledge of one person who is very experienced with uh, statistical data supported by technology. That is true, but that was our alternative, you know, to one person. But this statistical data, this experience that we gather by brewing every day of the year, unlike other breweries, that allowed us to have a very vast knowledge uh, in a very rapid time. And that's why we can create expressions that are very different from all the can. Uh, breweries. Then um, another part which could be appreciated by people who ever listen to uh, to the podcast, podcast or um, sees the brand aside is that at the moment we have the youngest and the largest team of Kunabiko in Japan. Oh wow! Okay. Average age from seven years old. So we do look forward to the future rather than back to to respectful traditions. Mm -hmm. But again, we want to innovate by giving hope and um, fresh blood to the sake industry. Uh, therefore, we have um, so many gravity with us because everything's not by hand. <laughs> Somebody has to do that sake. Yeah, so uh, that's I think answers um, the question by saying that we have a different approach yeah. to what most of the people have. Okay. You know, it's, it's, I think it's different and the same because you are, you are saying that, you know, because craft requires the, the use of hands, I, I actually agree with that. Um, is that the kind of image or the communication that you're trying to bring across to your consumers? Sure, definitely. We, we do only craft sake, we do my dad intro to 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to add that the G sake, like um, craft sake, there is no legal definition unlike uh, craft beer. So um, mm -hmm. it's very nice to use the romance of traditions and countryside of Japan. Uh, us too, we are in the countryside. <laughs> yeah. um, 45 minutes from Iwakuni. Uh, southwest of Japan, and uh, there's, um, I think, not much difference in terms of uh, approach to the brewing itself, except that that side, again, we look at the future more than that. Okay, yeah, so that side's uh, core uh, products, I mean, it's quite, it's quite well known, you know, we yeah. have your you 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 45, you have your 39, so right. Right. Are there any um, products that are like probably seasonal, you know, for example, if they use the rice, the production techniques, or is there something that's uh, more and more because of the demand? We have to add the statistical information that we have about uh, all our brewing side. Um, we can come up with different ideas. The latest one we can speak to you about is uh, Sumimata. 
is our newest version of Dasai Beyond. How we have been brewed with the Vintage Rice from 2019. It's available um, as an NFT. Nice. So, uh, so the label has been done by an Irish artist, Gary Ambush, and it's limited uh, to a bit more than 700 um, copies of this NFT certificate. So, come with me, we would have uh, probably a second little bottle here. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. And so, this is one experiment. Uh, then we have, of course, our Dasai Beyond, which is uh, our exper experimental uh, cube. Mm -hmm. uh, so, every year we twist the form a little bit. So that's why I want to push ourselves beyond. Then for a little time, we will have again Midaki, which is a Pasanet Ake, Bruges. And um, uh, by using on the side some classical music. Classical music? Yes. So like some wine uh, makers already do, we, want to, we are studying how the music impacts the vibrations, the fermentation. Okay. Actually, there is something about it, but still haven't found out exactly what. Right. Well, this is an interesting concept because I, um, I think a while ago I was just reading on, uh, I think it was Mue mm -hmm. Shindong's I can't remember which practitioner in spread that they they tag um, music, different kind of music to the different. Crude, they're very strong with this. Yeah, I think it could be crude because the, um, I think uh, somebody from Crude family was a big jazz fan. Mm -hmm. And uh, they started a few years ago to make um, a special tune to listen to the bubbles. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and when you know, the parents, they always like to give a heavy jazz of classical music. Okay. But then I'll tell you something that, you know, is um, I think a, a good uh, example of uh, what is a cyborg. Okay, looking at the future. Uh, through our uh, analysis of the technology, you know, such as the data, uh, we learned something something about exosomes. Yeah, okay. Right? So exosomes is something that I didn't know about before. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how it explained to me. Uh, like, like some living elements yeah. in any fermentation, either liquid or solid. And then after the, the, the product finishes the fermentation, they disappear. But actually these are very good for your health, technically. Okay. And they have a very interesting flavor. So the side invented a system to collect all these exosomes from different tanks of implementation and concentrate them in one single tank and preserve them. And that's how we created a new products uh, which might be seasonal or you know long term we see. It's called the Dex Masai exosomes. Okay. And we use it for the um, world 50 best uh, celebration ceremony in Tokyo and London. Uh, chefs really liked it and it's really hard to give a second. It's um, it will remind the wine world by one concept, which is concentration. Okay. Yeah, we have this uh, concentration back in some wines, and very strange, you find it in sake. Uh, well, I'm not saying this is um, very good for your, it's good for, for your health, but it does not load the legal framework, then will give me a hard time. <laughs> uh, but exosomes is really interesting that we're very proud to be the first brewery who's in this. So this is, uh, is it really out? She's yeah. not really out, yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. It's a few months. Wow. Um, okay. Again, it depends on the model, where you are in the world, you might have it or not. Uh, from yesterday, everybody's walking to Japan, they open the, the borders, with oh, the yeah, support yeah. for this kind of taste. Yeah. Yeah. We have got a lot of friends and, and associates that really flooded to, to Japan, to, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and they're posting on Instagram and whatnot. <laughs> they're having a time of their life, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Okay, well, so it's really interesting to know that you have so many different, you know, seasonal products, experimental products. Right. It's coming out. Um, in terms of production techniques, um, are there any specialty that that, that doesn't just focus on? Because I, if based on my my uh, recollection, I think uh, Nasa is one of the few breweries that uses centrifugal. I think yes, we were the first one actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, centrifugal was a technique born out of the quest to brighten the light of our uh, of the drinks of that side. Uh, by proposing the purest version of sake that you can. And so all our versions like the Ginjo are brewed with great care, okay? Uh, but this was not enough uh, for us. So at one point, somebody had the inspiration to um, see uh, and check what a centrifuge can do. And actually we found out it could be a great way to filter sake yeah. by kinetic uh, energy. So by moving uh, very fast, uh, the moromi inside the centrifuge, we could isolate in the center 
the liquid parts and then filter from the oils from a uh, uh, sink below and, um, and then have a wonderful I think, expression of the uh, site, uh, very different from the site And I think we're going to taste it today. Okay, yes. Oh, yes. Well, for those who don't know, um, Leopoldo is here to do a master class for right. uh, the trade. So, of course, I'm very excited to. And also, you know, very excited to taste <laughs> some of the new science out there. Okay, so just, you know, for uh, our listeners who don't know what uh, centrifuge is, it's, it's, it's kind of like it's a filtration process. Yeah, it's a machine. I heard that it actually was found in a nuclear plant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice place, you must come from different uh, places. Mm-hmm. So it's a very large machine, I would say, like uh, around two meters wide, okay, and has, um, has, a, has a, a cover. And um, you just add the, the liquid, and it spins, uh, you know, almost three thousand spins per minute. Wow! Okay. So it's super fast. In the absence of oxygen, right? There's no correct, uh, correct. Uh, you know, oxidation is first enemy for the worst. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, all the second, all the And uh, so it's been so fast that the, the semi-solid parts will be on the outer sides, and the liquid in the center. So PCP um, shows that there's, there's no friction in filtration. So we already have. Um, like many the cognac house or whiskey house, we use these uh, paper sheets, mm-hmm. classical machine, you know, the very long and rectangular machines yes, yes, also. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. Um, again, we use a special type of paper, which is called SF ceramic. Yes. SF ceramic. It's made out of ceramic actually. Okay. But it has the same mm, consistency of uh, cloth. Mm-hmm. So, uh, textile, right? Uh, but again, why? Because we believe it's more neutral, it doesn't break. And it's more accurate when filtering. But again, centrifuge one step ahead. Very interesting. Okay. And uh, I was, you know, looking through more information about Gasa again. And apparently, there is there are plans to have a brewery in, uh, in the U.S. The state of New York, yes. hundred twenty kilometers from the city of New York. Okay. At the Carnegie Institute of America, just across the street, because we really want to influence and educate the next generation of American chefs. And we believe that uh, New York is a great place to be. Uh, we already have some uh, food up, a little bit uh, food up in, uh, in USA. Um, but again, our effort is really to be closer to our American consumers. I believe that USA is our second uh, largest market. I see, right. So, um, and so that's I do is, is the new brewery, the new brewery that finally should open, you know, as a seven year old project. Oh, and we laid a little bit back to see the you know, visual. Um, Time that we need for this kind of projects, and uh, we should open anytime soon uh, between December and May of next year. Oh, that's good news. Yeah. Yeah. For anybody going to New York, to New York, but again, uh, part of it also will be exported to the rest of the world. We not only be for local consumption, okay, we plan most of it to be consumed locally. Uh, but again, uh, I already know some lectures from Macau, they call me and say, Leo, please, I need some bottles. <laughs> Well, that's I do. Okay, okay, yes, yes. Um, we'll be seeing you by the end. Okay, uh, but in, you know, in terms of things that there might be different, would be well, the water will be local water. Okay, okay, so different from the ones that we have to work with. But definitely, we chose that site because it's suitable for our region of sake. Mm-hmm. Uh, then the rice, for most probably the beginning, will be imported from Japan. But we're going to check in and see where we can grow the rice in mm-hmm. the state of New York or somewhere near that. Wow, man, yeah. it's to be fully sustainable locally. Yeah. And the team would be initially half Japanese, half American, then we'd be the majority of American. Okay. Would, would, you think, would you think that, I mean, obviously this is not confirmed, but do you think that the rice might be grown maybe more central into the USA or maybe more southern to the USA? I heard something about our chances. Okay. There are chances that it could be somewhere else as well. Yeah. Um, but it depends. I think some breweries. Uh, um, uh, Japanese growers in, in the USA, I think they grow their rice in North California. Yeah, okay. Uh, some of them in Arkansas as well. So we'll see, but the, nothing has been confirmed yet. Yeah, we are yeah. testing so much. <laughs> yeah. Trying to figure out uh, what the best solution is. I see. Yeah, because I had this impression that, you know, because uh, Yamada Nishiki is, mm-hmm. it needs slightly warmer climate, I suppose. Right. And yes. New York City is a very cold. Yeah, 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 very, very much. So we're going to wait around to check and see. Uh, what is best? Uh, again, as a first option, we'll be bought from Japan most likely. Okay, well, I'm really looking forward to the time. Let's see where that's like. Hopefully, I'll get a wee bit of some bottles. I'll write it down. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Um, what about collaborations? I mean, is there any like collaborations that you guys are already doing? Or I I, I know for a fact that um, with uh, Singapore Airlines, for example, right. I I've seen um, some of the batik designs that have been, mm -hmm. have been made. Are there any other collaborations that Dasa is currently doing with uh, you know global icons or? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I think the latest most of the market we're thinking about is that uh, also we are a sponsor of the Yankee Stadium. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, I read about that. Okay. Yes. That's you know, um, a turning page for the second industry, I would say. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, you know, I think the site really likes to do what it does best. Because things are very, very different. And I think it's great about that. Mm. But it's good that we have some collaborations, some special dinners with different chefs a little bit around the world. Um, but then in terms of co-branding, um, yeah, we are a little bit shy at the moment. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Okay, good to know. Hopefully, you know, uh, there will be a lot more exciting collaborations that we can expect uh, for that side. Um, we, we're actually closing at the end, but you know, just a bit more of uh, your, your hopes and dreams you know, for, for the brand you know, in the next coming, coming five years. You know. what, yeah. what do you think you hope to achieve with the brand? What we have to achieve is the fact that uh, to cope with the demand, which is already a double of our production. I mean, <laughs> imagine, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it's to give uh, uh, valuable, um, pleasant moments to everybody who discovers. Okay. You know, for me, uh, it's not the greatest pleasure to convince somebody that sake is much more than four letters mm -hmm. uh, or a very confused, a confusing idea uh, of what uh, Japan can offer. Uh, sake is so deep that it transcends. Uh, the liquid and the brewing techniques. Uh, as you want to see, I think later on, uh, sake is all about the dream. Yep. Uh, the dream in a bottle. And I think to let um, consumers travel to Japan and see new horizons, that's uh, the best wish I can have for the next years for me. Okay, well, that's a very beautiful way of uh, putting it. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, uh, I guess that's probably a good time to wrap up this month. Yeah. So, because we've got a, we've got a masterclass <laughs> to, uh, to run. Yeah. Uh, but you know, here's a quick shout out to uh, for all our listeners to check out our website for our schedules for all the uh, web certification programs that we have. Uh, we're running monthly, so and if you would like to listen to more of such streams content, please remember to like and subscribe. And lastly, please remember, uh, a drink always tastes better when it happens. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.